and minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalists podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Welcome to episode 160. Today we're going to talk about reevaluating our lives so we can make the changes that we need to make. We're going to talk about changes, Ryan. I'm going through changes. Man. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Freddie Mercury is doing a cover of that song. <laughs> Is that Black Sabbath or is that Ozzy, Sean? <clears throat> it's Ozzy. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Anyway, well, go ahead. Um, I mean, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> let's go ahead and dive into it. We're going to talk about changes today. And our first question is from Amanda in Toronto. It's a situation I'm having with a friend of mine. And recently, I kind of realized our relationship, our friendship has had a, like a shift in the friendship. And we have always been very close we've known each other from work and we've only known each other for maybe three years but we have been very good friends and uh, my friend and I we usually talk a lot on the phone and that's a big part of our relationship like multiple times a day and recently um, I kind of just want to concentrate on myself Um, I've changed a lot in the past few years and Minimalism and like focusing on like a simple life is so important to me, which kind of like doesn't work if you're going to be spending so many hours like chatting on the phone each night. And um, so I found it really hard to kind of tell my friend I need space all of a sudden when I realized like this relationship was kind of interfering with that because my friend wants to talk so many times on the phone every day about nothing and then doesn't really want to get together or have a relationship outside of that and so now that I've told my friend a few times like basically that I need space she feels threatened and like everything's over which isn't what I'm trying to do Um, but at the same time it's pushing me away and um, I think she feels hurt and so I guess like we're not on the same page and I don't know what to do. I think the first thing, Ryan, that we should talk to Amanda about here is that uh, she, she talks about she wants to simple life has become this main focus of hers but I think living a simple life shouldn't be the goal or the focus mm. that's like if you want to build a house but your focus is having a really nice tool belt mm. like and you're focused on the tool belt and if I have all of the right tools uh, situated appropriately in this tool belt I need to upgrade my hammer and what about this tape measure I need a better tape measure it's important to have the right tools and and simple living or minimalism is a tool and it's an important tool for improving the relationships and mm-hmm. what she's talking about here because I think Amanda originally called in for our breakups episode this is an interesting kind of breakup it's it's like a, a, a distancing or a breakup with a, a close friend yeah. in a way and and you and I have had a, a relationship for a while now she said her and this friend have always been close but in the very next sentence she said we've only known each other for three years mm. And so you can get close to someone after known for, th- for three years, but right. But I, I, w- I would just I would reposition the way that, that you're saying that because you haven't always been close. You've known this person for three years. We've always been close for the last three years. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you've probably gotten closer. You de- you've developed this this relationship. But with developing that relationship, unfortunately, there were some expectations that were poorly set at the beginning. This happens all the time. I know it especially happens, used to happen with me in intimate relationships. In fact, the opposite mm-hmm. happens with me now. Uh, the reason, One of the reasons that Bex and I have such a great relationship is uh, we did a really good job setting expectations early on. But with many relationships, we, we fall in this, uh, we, we fall in love, or really we fall in like, we fall in lust. There's this mm-hmm. great chemistry at the beginning. There's a newness in a relationship. And the same can certainly go for a friendship. And, and things start off... Uh, where we overcommit, we we overcommit ourselves, we overcommit to the relationship, we overcommit to activities. In this case, Amanda and her friend, uh, they're overcommitting to talking on the phone. Mm. Now, Amanda was also being a little bit dismissive of her friend when she said, oh, "My friend likes to talk about nothing." Mm. Uh, well, that's it's certainly not nothing to your friend, and and, right. and you got to have a little compassion for for this person there because clearly they want to talk about these things. Maybe it's venting for them. It may feel like nothing to you, but it is not nothing. 
nothing to them. It is something to them. Now you went to your friend, Amanda, and you said, hey, I need some space. That's probably not how I would handle this. Mm. Um, because I understand why she would feel threatened or she would feel, even, even if she doesn't feel threatened, she would feel discouraged. Mm. If you came to me, Ryan, you're like, Josh, I really need some space. I need my space from you. I'd be like, uh, that, uh, okay. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, right. like, you, you, well, because it, it doesn't, it, it, that isn't a, um, it's not concrete. Yeah, it's not concrete, and it's not a very loving way to tell someone that you need more time by yourself. When you say I need more space, you're not actually saying what you need. Right, <laughs> right. You're 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 actually putting it on the other person. You're putting a void out there. You're, right. you're saying I I need a space. What do you need that space for? I think it's better mm, to yeah. to articulate that. Now, for you, it might be, hey, I need I need more time for myself because I'm an introvert and it takes that time to to recharge. Or you know what? I really need to reconnect with my creativity. My creativity has been suffering because I've been spending too many hours doing blank. Mm -hmm. Or for you, I think this is the the maybe the more likely example for you amanda is you're gonna have to reset some expectations hey this relationship started off we started speaking on the phone two or three hours a night i realized i'm not really a phone person mm -hmm. and this isn't speaking on the phone just isn't for me i know with uh, bex and i, I set that expectation early on where it's like hey i'm not a phone person we're not going to be talking on the phone is that okay with you mm -hmm. and um uh, early on, I remember our very first date. She asked me. She like sent this li this list of like some potential things that we could do. It was it was on my birthday, mm. and one of the things was like horseback riding. I'm like, you're welcome to go horseback riding on my birthday. I won't be there for it. <laughs> um, and, and and the thing was just like setting the expectations and being radically honest about it, but mm. in a way that isn't offensive, that is not dismissive. It's understanding of what their needs are, what their preferences are, what they like. But it's also letting them know what your preferences are in a kind, caring, compassionate way. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think with Amanda, I mean, if I was her, I'd be asking myself, uh, how good of a friend am I? And I'm not saying Amanda is or is not a good friend, but that's where it would start. And what does it mean to be a good friend? It means to be supportive. Mm -hmm. It means to, uh, well, so being supportive, though, there's a lot of ways to be supportive, right? Um, it means supporting the other person's um, expectations, supporting them if, if they have certain goals they're trying to reach, supporting them taking actions. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different levels of support there. Um, how, how else do you be a good friend? Well, I think as long as those expectations don't impend on uh, – or trample your your life, right? Yeah. And so we have to keep that in mind as well because right now what, what she's saying is this friend has a, an unrealistic expectation of our relationship. But mm -hmm. guess what, Amanda? You created that expectation and that isn't, you accidentally were a bad friend in doing that. You set some, some poor expectations. Uh, now yeah. here's the thing. It's always great to experiment with different things. I know uh, here, here's an, a work example for us, but I think it'll translate to this, Ryan. We've been, we've been doing a whole bunch of different things with YouTube, just experimenting with quickie videos, living room conversations, full editions of the podcast, behind the scenes, live lecture, election coverage. We did one of those <laughs> today. Uh, and, and, and so like, we do all these things on our YouTube channel just as experiments, knowing though, we set the expectation early on that, hey, we're gonna pull something back from some of this. We're gonna learn some lessons from this. Right. Here's the good news though, Amanda, you've learned a lesson. You're not really a foam person. Or, that's or, okay. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to present that forward. Now, in terms of supporting someone, how, how can you support someone? You can listen. I think that's one of the best things we can do. You know, Ella just got her first report card ever. And she, it was great, except, she is not a active listener, <laughs> which is so true. I think it's true for many five-year-olds, but I think it's especially true with Ella. And I'll tell you what, I, I suffer from that as well, although I do a really good job now. I do a better job than most people. It's just like um, I'm really bad with names. Mm. But because I'm really bad with names, I've gotten really good with names. Yeah. Because I realize it is a fault of mine, but it's also something I can make up for, right? Mm. And so when we go downstairs to the parking garage here, you and I are maybe two of the only people in the entire building here, the six-story building, who know Jose and we know... Um, Ed we and we know Carlos and, and we know like Austin downstairs and, and Aaron and and Andrew and like we know the people who are working in the building mm -hmm. and it's not because I'm good with names no it's because I made a concerted effort to go out of my way to be kind to these people I listened yeah and, and well I mean everything that you're talking about uh, this this is what it takes to be a good friend 
Um, and I know we're not friends with everyone in the building, but taking initiative like that, I think th- there are things like that that really uh, help help one to be a very good friend. And the reason why I think Amanda should start at asking herself, like, how good of a friend am I? It's because if I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it on me because I don't want to talk about Amanda and her friend. So um, if I'm Amanda, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm saying, "Hey, hey, Ryan." Um, how have, you, how have you treated this person? How good of a friend have you been with this person? If I can look in the mirror and say, dude, you've really gone out of your way to support the preferences. You've gone out of their way to be a good friend, to add value to their lives, to, to contribute towards that us box. Mm-hmm. Then at that point, I can look at the, that other person and feel totally comfortable asking them whatever I want. Now, I think that now when Amanda said to her, I need my space, you might want to just reframe it a little bit. I know with uh with tough conversations i have and i talk we talk about this all the time it's the i versus you Mm. you're an amazing friend you're awesome i have a problem uh because i need uh i need to have more time in my evenings for myself because i'm an introvert Mm. um just simply explaining uh, putting it on yourself and explaining why why you need that time that is going to help it come across a lot better than just looking at someone and saying i need space (laughs) um it's funny because that is actually using the i versus you like that's that is a statement that sounds like that, but it's uh-huh. still, it still is projected at the other well, person. It, though, because it's pre- it's also it's it's open ended. Pre- it was presenting a negative as as opposed to telling her what she needs space for. What is the affirmative? Mm-hmm. Hey, I'd really, I really need to take time to focus on blank. Yep. Don't tell them what you don't want. Tell them what you do want, not just for your relationship. That's important, mm-hmm. but for yourself so that they can better support you as well. Yeah. And I think setting those expectations too, like that is part of being a good friend. Like Josh, I would never want you to just commit to me, say yes to everything that I ask you to do just because you want to say yes. I know you wouldn't do that, but um, let's say you were that type of person where you just, you know, people pleaser, I want to say yes to everything. Uh, if you didn't set proper expectations with me, or in fact, you were you were causing uh, uh, discomfort or harm to yourself mm. because of, of not setting those expectations, like that's, to me, that's actually not being a good friend. That's just... That's just going with the flow, and I don't want friends who just go with the flow. Personally, yeah, and and, and since we're talking about about changes here, mm-hmm. I think one of the things to note is sometimes relationships change over time. Yeah, the person who was your best friend in elementary school likely isn't your best friend right now, mm-hmm. and the same is true. The people who were good friends when we were, we worked in the corporate world in our in our twenties. They're not necessarily good friends now. They, they might have been secondary relationships for us. They're now tertiary or non-existent relationships. Now, mm-hmm. relationships change over time. And sometimes you can graduate from a relationship and you can appreciate it for what it was. I'm not telling you, Amanda, to, to walk away no. from this relationship. But always know that that is an option, walking away and, and change having the relationship change. Now, keep in mind, people don't hate change. They hate being changed. There are plenty of changes that we would all accept heartily right now, right? Like if uh, Ryan, I say, hey, Ryan, I changed your bank account. There's now an extra million dollars in it. You'd be extra, like, I don't even have one million in there. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You have you know, at least $15. Now there's $1 million and $15 in there. <laughs> right, sure. And and uh, you'd be like, wow, I love that change. Yeah. We don't hate change. We hate being changed. Now, yeah. if you had a million dollars in there, I'm like, hey, Ryan, I took a million dollars out of your bank account. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, I don't want to be changed. Um, yeah. and, and the same is true. Obviously, that's a, a parodic, exaggerated example. But I think it illustrates what, what we go through. People don't want to be dragged to where you are. They would much rather go there willingly on their own. Or mm-hmm. they'd lo- like for you to meet in the middle with them. In fact, Ryan, our relationship has changed over the years. You sure. and I have known each other since fifth grade. and um, We in- used to bond over, you know cheeseburgers cheese anything that had cheese on it yeah cheese whiz and now you can't eat cheese i know it's, and i mean could you imagine if i was like oh we can't bond over cheese related products now i need my space <laughs> 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 i'm gonna fill that space with cheese uh no i i think that i i think that you and i we had you know a particular relationship then and then the high school was different it was me my brother jerome your best friend at the time pacho and yeah. you it was like mm-hmm. we we were like we looked like this 
Harvard diversity poster. Right. And, uh, and, and it was just the four of us hanging out. And so like we were friends sort of by proxy because we, uh, I hung out with Jerome, Jerome hung out with Pacho, Pacho hung out with you. And then all of us sort of got together mm. and we were friends that way. Not necessarily like the best, fr- best of friends then. And then right after high school, um, well, you and I sort of sort of went different ways. I went in the corporate world. You went to go work for your dad. You got married at eighteen. Uh, I didn't get married until I was twenty-two. And so there was like a f- right as I was getting divorced, you were getting married, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, there was this four-year period where I don't know if we had any contact with each other during that four-year period. If, yeah. if so, it was rather limited. Maybe yeah, it was really small, once yeah. or twice in that four-year period. And so even the best of friends, you know, we're, we're um, business partners. We're great friends. I, we, our relationship has changed dramatically over the last almost 30 years at this point. Yeah. It's changed several times. So even people as close as us, the relationship changed. In fact, I would argue that our relationship right now is different from what it was when we started The Minimalists, Mm -hmm. but it's also probably different from when like 2013, 2014, where you and I, in 2013, you and I were both single. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And and so we weren't committed to a you know we were business partners but we didn't have bed partners at the time. Right. And so like we we were just single guys. In fact, we lived t- together at one point yeah. in like 2012, 2013. Saw each other pretty much every day. Right. Yeah. And so that relationship was different. And now Amanda has this coworker who she probably sees nearly every day. Right. Mm-hmm. But this relationship will change over time. Yeah. Maybe not immediately, but it's almost guaranteed. The only thing that is almost guaranteed is that some sort of change will happen. Mm-hmm. You get to determine whether that change is for the better mm-hmm. and better for you, for the relationship, or if you're just going to drag the relationship through because you want it to be the same way forever. Yeah. I mean, I think w- w- with Amanda, and uh, her changing this relationship that, that she's asking us for advice on. Um, first and foremost, she has to be a good friend. After she's done that, then she can go to her friend and say, hey, like here are the expectations that that um, I need your help with. This isn't, these aren't, you know, black and white expectations, but here are some things I'd like to discuss with you to see how we can maybe, uh, you know, accommodate what my needs a little bit more. That doesn't mean that she has to stop talking on the phone or talk on the phone for two hours. I mean, she, she could simply say, hey, look, because she mentioned on the, on the voicemail too that like uh, her friend doesn't meet in person a lot. Mm. So she could say to her friend like, hey, look, I really enjoy our conversations together and, 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 you know, we've had just these hours and hours of conversations. Um, in fact, every day, you know, it's a couple hours, you know, I, I, you know, a, I am finding it hard to devote that much time. And it's, it's really, um, you know, it's really important to me that we have time together, but for me to give you two hours every single day on the phone, that, that is not, uh, it's just not something that I can do. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And then the other thing too is if she wants to meet in person more, she could totally throw out the idea, hey, you know, let's, let's uh, at least meet up once a week. Um, what I'm really getting at here. Oh, and that, it, to, to build on that, that yeah. actually builds up anticipation for the, the, yeah. the relationship too. Like my friend Adam, I'm going to call him back today. He sent me a text like, we've been trying to connect for the last two weeks. It's just every time I call him, he's not available. Every time he calls me, I'm recording a podcast or something. <laughs> and and we're going to try to re- reconnect today. But like it builds that anticipation, gives me things to think about. So we're not talking about nothing. We're talking mm. about something. Yeah, and you know what to expect. So um, really what I'm getting at with Amanda here is find a compromise with your friend. So it doesn't have to be, we're only going to meet in person. We're not going to talk on the phone anymore. And it doesn't also mean that Amanda is going to give up all her preferences and just continue this relationship and talk on the phone for two hours a day so yes you can schedule calls you can schedule uh uh you know meeting in person but amanda as long as you're being a good friend and as long as you are uh uh, you know using that i versus you when when you're trying to express your feelings and your needs when again that i versus you is anytime you say the word you it's something positive anytime you say something negative that's when you put it on yourself i am an introvert I need more time for myself. You're such an awesome friend that I know you're going to help me find that time for myself. Right. So as long as you're doing that, then Amanda, you're doing everything you can. And I bet you, I just bet you, if you're that close for the last three years, that your friend is going to help you find a compromise. And I like that word compromise, Ryan, because you do want to find the compromise, the middle ground that works for both of you mm. without sacrificing your values. Absolutely. And keep that, because right now what's happening is you are f- sacrificing your values. One of those values is how you use your most precious resource, your time. 
And uh, Amanda, I'd love to send you a copy of our book. It's called Everything That Remains. It's my favorite thing that we've ever written. I got a copy. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it right here. I'll hold that up. Is this the camera, Jordan? Nope. No. No. Oh, this one. <laughs> all right. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, it's everything that remains. It's the story of Ryan and I making a whole lot of changes mm. in our life. Uh, we we were these suit and tie corporate guys throughout our 20s. We grew up really poor. So we changed from being really poor. We focused on the wrong thing. It was putting money first and 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 really only money was the pursuit for a while status achievement i guess were, were the other pursuits yeah. yeah but the proxy was for that was money and um there's a couple chapters in there about about changes habit change was a was a big one uh that was in chapter number eight and then ryan you mentioned the us box there's an entire chapter in there about the us box and that's changing a, relationships that's an important concept i feel like to understand when when dealing with relationships so, Sean, if you could reach out to Amanda and uh, send her an audiobook version of Everything That Remains. If you like our podcast, you'll love the audiobook version of Everything That Remains. Or if you want the book book or the ebook, we're happy to send those to you as well. And for the rest of y'all, we'd love to hear what you have to say. So if you have a comment or tip about changes, including advice for our caller today, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839. You can also email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. We'll air our favorite comments and tips on a future episode. And stay tuned to the end of this episode for this week's listener comments and tips. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round where we answer questions from social media. Yes, indeed. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Minimalists during the lightning round. This is where Ryan and I each do our best to answer every question with just a short shareable Less than 140 character response. We also put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And now you can find all of our quotes in one place. Thanks to our good friend, Jessica Lynn Williams. You can head on over to minimalmaxims.com. All righty. Our first lightning round question is from Alicia. Alicia writes in, I've changed to a job that makes me a lot happier, but a lot less pay. My family has had to make changes because of it. What are some changes one can make to make a change like this more sustainable? It's a lot of change. <laughs> right? Put that change in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's, uh, I'll give you the pithy answer and then we'll talk about it a little bit because this is the biggest change I had to make in my own life. And I talked yeah. about it in everything that remains. Um, so my, my pithy answer is debt free is the new pay raise. Amen. And, and that's the one thing to think about. Like, if you have all of these debts, if you have student loan debt, if you have car debt, you know, you got this car payment every month, you're paying for this oversized house, maybe it's a mortgage, maybe it's just a, a luxury condo or whatever, you're, you're paying a, a big payment over there. Maybe you're paying for the credit card debt that you have, yeah. or you're paying for, you know, the, 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 you know, all these other, um, bills that we have right debt payments yes they're just debt payments but debt free is the new pay raise because if you get rid of that debt you've automatically given yourself a pay raise so uh if you don't owe anybody anything mm -hmm. then you give yourself the freedom to do anything yeah dude you can it's tweet that too sean <laughs> it's funny because like I, I don't get it as often but I used to get it a lot when we first started The Minimalist. People would be like, oh, well, it's easy for you because, you know, you walked away from the corporate world and you obviously had, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of dollars saved up and, uh, you know, you're single and, you know, it's all these like these assumptions. Excuses. Too. Ex yeah, excuses. And ultimately, I would just say to those people like, no, 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 it's easy for me because I spend less money than what I make. Mm. And it's not, it's not about having thousands and thousands of dollars saved up. Certainly, it's, 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 it is a great idea to have a safety net and to save for retirement. I'm, I'm not trying to say that those things aren't important. But what I'm saying is, is ultimately, if you want to uh, have the freedom, if you want to be financially secure, you have got to start spending less money than what you make today. It's you okay to sacrifice your comfort as long as you're not sacrificing your values yes and i think that's one of the things we were spending money on all these like creature comforts mm -hmm. and and we're actually stepping all over our values and doing things that don't align with the person we want to become and yeah. by the way bravo to alicia here for stepping in that direction and yeah becoming the person she wants to be even if it means making a little bit less money or a lot less money in the process yeah congratulations alicia uh, my, my short answer is this. If we put money first, 
a meaningful life becomes the opportunity cost. So what I mean by that for, for Alicia is sometimes we might take this pay decrease so we can live a more meaningful life. And then once we take that pay decrease, we start to feel the, the pains or the discomfort, not pain, but maybe discomfort of those, those, uh, those comforts mm -hmm. that maybe we have to give up. Yeah. But the thing is, is to, to really feel good about the decision that Alicia's made. She, she has to remind herself how she gave up that you know, piece of her salary. She gave up the comforts. Yeah, so she could live a more meaningful life. A comfortable life is not a meaningful life. And here's how I look at it, man. Like when I, so I don't know, I made 150 or 175,000 bucks that year, that last uh, year I left um, the corporate world. Right. Did not have thousands of dollars saved up. Uh, had nothing to show for the salary that I was making for all those years. But what I'll say though, is that when the next year when I made like 27,000 bucks, uh -huh. 28,000 bucks, I forget how much it was, I, I legitimately kind of had this conversation with myself like, man, like I made so much less money this year and I've never been happier. And like I have never, I, I traveled more that year than I'd ever traveled uh, thanks to readers letting us stay on their floor and uh, yeah. you know, us sleeping in our car. I mean, it wasn't like we spent, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to, to go on that book tour. But, but I, I would sit there and I, I, I sat there and I remember asking myself like, okay, um, I made a hundred and called $150,000 less or $125,000 less than the previous year. Mm -hmm. Would I pay someone a hundred and if I had the money, mm -hmm. if I, if I could afford it, mm -hmm. would I pay someone $125,000 to relive that year? And I absolutely would have. And that's that's what it comes down to. So, Alicia, if you, if you ever start to feel the pain, mm. you've got to ask yourself, like, and when I say the pain, the pain of, of getting rid of those comforts, you've got to ask yourself and say, okay, if I'm, if I'm making $10,000 less a year, you've got to ask yourself, would I spend or would I pay someone $10,000 if it would alleviate the stress of making that extra $10,000, yeah. if it would allow me to live a more meaningful life with my family, the answer is usually going to be yes. Yeah. If the answer is no, then yeah, do something, do, do something different. Um, you know, minimalism isn't about deprivation. It's not about uh, just living with as little as possible. It's about living intentionally yeah. and asking yourselves questions like that are going to help you live more intentional. Alicia, I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Essential. It's an essay collection. With 150 essays, 12 different chapters about 12 areas of intentional living. And uh, there's a, an entire chapter in here about finances, including the plan that you and I went through to make sure we got out of debt and more importantly, stayed out of debt once we got there. Mm -hmm. That's that's the like the important next step. But also investing in, in your future as well, even on a, uh, a smaller or much smaller income. So I hope you enjoy that copy of Essential. Sean, if you could reach out to her, give her the audio book, the book book or the ebook, whichever she'd like. P.S. Ryan, we we have one more question. All right. O'Rourke asks, I'd like a deeper dive into the impact of involving others in your lives, wives, girlfriends, family. So Ryan, what do you do with your wives and girlfriends? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know about each other. <laughs> <laughs> in your documentary, Minimalism, it appeared as if you were... And uh, you were on a singular journey. We kind of were for that documentary, maybe. Yeah, we, which is easier to direct. What changes when you add partners? Mm. So, if you'd like to hear our answer to that question, we'll talk about. Um, we'll talk about since our lives have changed considerably. We both have. We yeah. both have partners now. We also have employees. That's something else to think about, right? We have a whole team of people we work with they're now. Kind of partners too, in a way. Yeah, yeah. They're partners. Uh, they're part of this team. Yeah. And the people in my life are often just part of of, of a team. So, you like to, if you like to hear our answer to that question, we'll have a whole conversation about it. You can listen to this week's postscript episode over at the Minimalist Private Podcast, available exclusively to our Patreon supporters. So, if you want to support our show and keep this podcast a hundred percent advertisement free, then head on over to theminimalists.com slash support. In addition to our weekly postscript episodes, the Minimalist private podcast feed includes our Ask the Minimalist Anything episodes, unreleased recordings of our live events, and the entire back catalog of past private episodes. Once you become a supporter, you'll receive a personal link to our private podcast feed so that it plays in your normal podcast player, whatever you're using to listen to this podcast right now. You can find all the, de the details and all the good stuff over at theminimalists.com slash support. 
And here is a snippet from this week's Postscript episode. Even with a partner, it's a singular journey. Mm. Because change starts with yourself. Yeah. And so any change that you want to implement, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world, you write the blog that you want to blog in the world, like it all sort of starts with yourself. Mm -hmm. And then of course, it's a it's a ripple effect. All right, y'all, now it's time for our added value portion of the show. This is where we each talk about something that has added value to our lives recently. Ryan, just this uh, past weekend, Bex and I went to go see a movie, and it was one of those movies that is so moving. It's probably the most moving movie that I've ever seen. Wow. Um, it's called Beautiful Boy. Okay. And it, What's it about? It is about a it's sort of the opposite of our childhood in a way where it's about a father whose son gets addicted to drugs, uh, both opium and, and meth, Mm. but all all drugs really. I mean, uh, cocaine and, and weed and, and just everything. He's, 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 I mean, it sounds like my, uh, a similar upbringing for me, but okay. Right. Well, the (laughs) the, the thing is the dad, he, he, he lives like this perfect sort of middle class life. Oh, I see. Okay. And you and I didn't live these perfect middle class lives, yeah. and and it it sort of it did a couple things. One is it illustrated the sadness of the drug epidemics that are going on. You and I are from Dayton, Ohio, the the overdose capital of America, and so we know about about that. You know, we we have a lot of friends and family who have overdosed. We know people who have died from from overdoses from opioids mm. and and this was a little bit different because it also sh- it also showed the impossibility of parenting in a way mm. which was both upsetting and freeing at the same time yeah because i realized like you oh you can do everything right and yeah. it still gets screwed up yeah or you can do everything wrong like my parents kind of did everything wrong and somehow i still made it out of that oh yeah and and um and I, I realized, like, with Ella, like, all I could do is the best that I can do, given the resources and the knowledge, the wisdom that I have. Mm. But some of it has to do with a little bit of luck. And ultimately, she's going to have to make her own choices when she becomes of age. Mm-hmm. And and all I can do is guide her in, in the right direction, hope that I provided enough knowledge that she does move in, in the right direction. But the movie itself was, I mean, every time I looked over, Bex was just tears streaming down her face Aww. and and i mean it was it it it's such a great film because like man it stayed with me like mm. i felt it on my nerve endings this mm. film is amazing it's in theaters uh now if you can still find it i'm sure it'll be on streaming soon it's called beautiful boy it makes me like that that makes me feel nervous about being a parent if mariah and i ever have kids i mean we plan on having kids one day but you know it may not ever happen but the the thought of trying to do everything to the best of your ability mm. but there's a certain point where you've got to relinquish control and you see that in the film and you see actually you, the hardening yeah. of parenting like oh my god dealing with the the relapse and how relapse is part of recovery and mm-hmm. and man it's it's heartrending and it is so real. And yeah. by the way, uh, Steve Carell is in it. He's the father in there. Oh, and oh okay. my God, he does such I've a good seen job. This preview, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's I'll have to check it out. It is a phenomenal movie. Beautiful boy. All Ryan, right, what's here, been adding value to your life? Uh, for those on YouTube, I'm showing you what my added value is right now. This camera, Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is a book called Micro Living. My my good friend Derek Diedrichson, He just uh, released this, I think, on October 30th. But what's cool about this is it's it's basically uh, 40 tiny homes that he kind of uh, does these very simple dives into, but very meaningful dives. Now, did he design so, all of these himself? He did not. So he found... He but found, he is a tiny house designer but, and builder. Yes, and he's got like his own show on... I think he still has his own show on HGTV. But regardless, if he doesn't, he... Uh, I'm pretty sure he still does. But if he doesn't, he had like a reality show where he would kind of take... Um, he would just build these tiny houses and, right. and it was like from, it wasn't like going to Home Depot and just buying all the material. It was like, you know, incorporating and reusing, recycling some materials to create these beautiful tiny homes. What I really like about this book though, is that it, it goes into like what the home is like. And then it has like these floor plans. Again, I'm showing this on YouTube, but it has these floor plans where you can kind of get an idea. Uh, it's not like exact blueprints, but it does give you measurements and stuff 
Um, but there's just a lot of ingredients here. Like I look forward to taking this book um, and I've got a couple other tiny house books um, and Mariah and I, we're going to eventually build our own, I'm going to call it a simple home because I don't know if we're going to do like 200 square feet, but maybe like 800 square feet, something like that. Yeah. But I can already see some of the ingredients uh-huh. that I'm going to take out of this book for uh, for our own recipe. But what I particularly like about this book is each chapter goes into uh, you know the, the the person who um, who has this tiny house, why they have this tiny house, and then it's it's uh, uh, Derek or uh, he actually goes by Deke. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, Deke go, goes in there and he talks about what his takeaways are from this house. But my favorite part of each chapter, he's got an in retrospect section mm-hmm. and this this is the most valuable piece to me in every single chapter how we failed yeah how we failed or how we would have done it differently what we didn't plan for what we would have would have planned better it, for that's what i mean by fail like, yeah. it, not the negative connotation of fail but like hey this is a failure let's learn from it yeah so we can do better next time or so other people can do better next time yeah so even if you're if even if you don't ever plan on buying a tiny home or building a tiny home uh, Micro Living uh, by uh, Deke Diederson, Diederson is, is it's an amazing book. Um, just very inspiring and just beautiful illustrations. Beautiful illustrations. Great photos. And pictures. Yeah. And Fo- oh, yeah, I guess photos, not illustrations. <laughs> and my good friend Ryan Nicodemus has a chapter in there. Oh, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan wrote a chapter in the book, um, which he doesn't get compensated for, but no, no. Uh, wanted to help contribute. But uh, uh, I, yeah, I really like the fact that you, you go through this book and there's like, look, you can build a tiny house for thirty thousand dollars or three hundred thousand oh, yeah. dollars oh yeah like, they show you some like what are they tiny house mansions mm, pretty much i mean like, <laughs> not really they're, they're still tiny but yeah. like but it's all the sort of uh, accoutrements and so uh different budgets as well sean can you put a link to that in the show notes for us all right let's move on to right here right now this is where we talk about what's going on in the lives of the minimalists a great new essay on our website i say great because i wrote it um <laughs> it's called uh, more complete uh, I, I realize ryan that that there's there's often this like um uh, and, and we'll put a link to this essay in the show notes as well. You can always find new writings just over at theminimalists.com. But on my walk here to the studio, when I, I walk here several days a week, um, whenever I walk here, there are, if I walk, take this one particular path, there's like half a dozen to a dozen different art galleries on these couple side streets. And um, they have like really great artwork there, right? And every time I walk past, like my first inclination is like, Oh, wouldn't that look great in Ella's room? Or oh, that would look really good in our dining room. Oh, or, yeah. Maybe that would be perfect in our bedroom or whatever. Like this painting, this photograph, this frame, whatever it might be, that would be perfect. It would make my living room more complete. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. There's no such thing. I mean, even grammatically, there's no such thing as more complete. Right. If something is complete, it it literally can't be more complete right that's like saying something is very unique it's either unique or it's not it can't be more unique than something mm. and and so I've, what i've realized is that quite often there are these things that amplify that enhance that augment our experience of life mm. and if that's true then great bring it into your life but just don't think that the thing is going to make your life more complete right you are already complete without the thing and so i've got a essay there at the minimalist we'll put a link to that in the show notes and speaking of the minimalists.com a new month is here ryan just a couple days away from december 1st want to play a game (laughs) 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 it's funny uh just yesterday we were um in this thrift shop we were recording a new video hopefully I, i don't know if this video will be out yet uh, by the time this episode's out, but uh, the 30 day minimalism game is right around the corner. Uh, just go to the minimalists.com slash game. We've had tens of thousands of people play the 30 day minimalism game. It's one of the most popular searches on YouTube uh, with respect to minimalism. It's in the top three searches, I think. Wow. Uh, if you search minimalism. And so we're doing a video about it as well about the 30-day minimalism game. Here's how it works. You partner up with someone at the beginning of the month. So find a friend, a family member, a coworker, someone who's willing to let go of some stuff with you next month. And you can do this any month. That's, that's the beauty of this game. It starts over every single month. So you find someone who's willing to let go of some stuff and at the beginning of the month, you each decide to get rid of one item on the first day. Second day of the month, two items. Third day of the month, three items. Starts off really easy, gets you that momentum you need to keep going, builds that momentum because let's face it, decluttering is kind of boring, 
right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we found a way to make it a little, a little bit more fun and less overwhelming. You walk into your house, if you're like the average American household, you have 300,000 things in your home, you don't even know where to start. Well, it doesn't matter. You can start with one thing on day one. Mm -hmm. Two things the next day. So anyone can get rid of one thing. Anyone can get rid of two things. But by the middle of the month, it gets more difficult. Because day 15, you have to get rid of 15 items. And then you realize, oh, crap, tomorrow I got to get rid of 16 items. Now, at the beginning of the month, you bet something. You can bet a dollar or a meal. Bet whatever you want. And whoever goes the longest throughout the month wins. If you both make it to the end of the month, then you've both won because you've gotten rid of about 500 items. And that's a really good start. And you can join tens of thousands of other people who are playing the game. They're sharing their experience. They're sharing their photos as well. Just uh, use the hashtag men's game, like minimalist, M-I-N-S-G-A-M-E, hashtag men's game. In fact, Sean, in the show notes, put a, a link to the Instagram, hashtag men's game. Yeah. You can see tens of thousands. It's inspiring, I think man. it's over seventy or 80,000 photos that are up there it's right inspiring, now. inspiring, dude. It's funny. It was uh, like three or four months ago, uh, Mariah and I... We were like, God, like we're looking at our junk drawer. I'm like, we could play the men's game <laughs> like, with all our stuff. So we together did the men's game. We weren't, it wasn't a competition. Mm -hmm. We totally did go through it and we were able to get rid of about 500 things. And, and Bex and I did it last year. Um, mm -hmm. We just got rid of Ella's stuff. It's super easy to get rid of their toys. <laughs> don't do that. No, uh, please don't. Well, but actually do do that, but have your kids participate. Don't get rid of anyone right. else's stuff for them. That's yeah. called theft. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> So, speaking of games, today was election day. We're actually recording this a little bit early because Ryan and I have some travels coming up. So mm -hmm. we're recording this uh, a couple weeks before it comes out. And we just did a whole, I think, 36-minute video on YouTube mm -hmm. about election day. Now, you yeah. and I have different political beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, we have the same values, but radically different beliefs. And but we had this great conversation about how, even though we have different beliefs, we can get along. And we also came up with the idea of how to get people more informed. And, and here's the thing. We talked about our differences. And so, Sean, if we can put a link to that. we did, It was a YouTube Live video that we did, but it stays posted. So it was called Behind the Scenes Live, The Minimalists on Election Day. And Sean, if you can put a link to that, we just really talked about how our differences, but how we don't let our differences tra uh, trample each other. But mm -hmm. we also talked about our other responsibilities outside of voting and how important some of these other responsibilities are in addition to voting. Yeah. Yeah. M I mean, most importantly, how uh, uh, being informed is is really, really important. Yeah. Um, and it's not just with voting. I mean, yes, uh, being informed will help you um, cast the ballot in a little bit more of a deliberate way, but being informed in general, whether it's your health, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's your, you know, uh, your diet, whatever it is, even exercise. It's like, there's so many different things that we vote yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. So many different things we vote on. So uh, yeah, being informed is really important. All right. Uh, if you want to comment on this episode, you can do so over at youtube.com slash the minimalist. Just comment over there. Also on YouTube right now, we have some quickie episodes. We have living room conversations. We do one living room conversation every week. And uh, we got some house tours coming soon. My house, Ryan's house, and maybe your house. If you're listening to Wait this, a minute. we might be right behind you right now with Jordan and a camera. <laughs> All right. Uh, and if you want our podcast show notes in your inbox, you always hear me and Ryan talking to a podcast, Sean, over there. Just sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. Just type your email in at the top, and we'll send you the show notes every time a new episode comes out. Also, any new writings from The Minimalist will show up in your inbox. But, of course, we'll never send you spam or junk or advertisements because all of those things suck. Uh, speaking of email, uh, Simple Sundays. Every Sunday, we send you an email in addition to the, the show notes we send on Tuesdays. Uh, so new essays or maybe new videos, something that is has to do with simplicity, simple living, just simple advice for simple living. New emails every Sunday if you sign up for that email list. Ryan, what else you got for us? I got some of these voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hey guys, my name is Tanya. I live in Seattle, Washington. I'm originally from Nova Scotia, Canada. I just wanted to comment on your Black Friday podcast that you did recently. Um, growing up in Canada, we didn't have J.C. Penney and Macy's and we didn't have the big Black Friday sales like they do here in the States. And uh, it was always my dream <laughs> to go to one of those. In 2007, my husband and I moved to Florida and uh, I met some friends. I was like, can we please do the Black Friday thing? It's been a bit of a weird dream of mine. So uh, we did and it was fun and we had a great time and we did that for a couple years. 
uh, when I look at it now, it's just so sad um, how much money is spent and people are hurt at these sales and sometimes killed at these sales. And, and for what? We're running around buying stuff we don't need and and can't afford, and it just doesn't really make sense. Um, since we live out here on the West Coast, it's been really hard to send anything home to my family. It's just really expensive, and uh, since we've lived here, we decided not to uh, send anything for Christmas and not to exchange gifts. And really, you know, my dad's older, and, and so are my sister and I, and, and our kids are in their teens and 20s, and none of us really need anything, so we just didn't see the point. Um, since we've lived here, the kids and I go to the Thanksgiving Day Parade in Seattle on Black Friday, and we go to the parade, and then afterwards, uh, what we do is we hand out lunches to people that are on the streets, the homeless people on the streets, who there are a lot of here in Seattle. It's really sad. And uh, we make up turkey sandwiches, and we have an orange and a bottle of water and um, like cookies and stuff. And last year, we also collected uh, scarves and gloves. And we hand them out to the homeless people. And I think it's been really great to show my kids that, you know, it's important to um, give to people that um, just don't have um, things and just are less fortunate than us. So uh, it's been really good. So we're going to do that again this year. And um, my dad and my sister last year for Christmas, they actually went to the local police station to talk to some of the officers and just find out if there were some needy families um, that could use anything specific. And there was one little boy who, who all he wanted for Christmas last year was a Christmas tree. And between my dad and my sister, she had a tree, they had extra ornaments and lights, and they packaged it all up really nice. And they took it back to the station and the officers delivered it to the family. And I guess the little boy was just absolutely thrilled. Uh, the other thing my dad and my nephew did was they had gone to a hockey game and they won jerseys from the players. And my dad was all excited. My nephew, who's 24, said, uh, Granddad, I think we're giving to people this year. And dad's like, you're right. So they packaged up the hockey jerseys. They bought some extra hockey tickets and bought a gift certificate to a local restaurant. And again, they went back to the police station and the officers delivered that to uh, a less fortunate family who otherwise wouldn't have had um, a Christmas. And it was nice. The family was able to go out for dinner into the game and, and wear the jerseys. So um, that's kind of what we're trying to do. And it's a great example for our kids and just to show that um, giving is, you know, more important than receiving. Hello, this is Leah from Denmark, but I'm calling from Austria, where I study design and visual communication. I have a comment about your last episode about Black Friday, which is a concept that I was always personally against and I have often boycotted Black Friday completely. Uh, but my views changed as Black Friday gave me the opportunity to save money on a product that I'm already using. Uh, I subscribe to Adobe Creative Cloud, which is a software bundle that costs a lot of money, especially for students. But I really need it for school, so I view this subscription more as a monthly bill rather than a consumer good. Uh, the specific software bundle that I use for school, it went on sale for Black Friday at uh, 20% off. And I was bold and I straightly asked Adobe if they could change my payment to match this discounted price. And they said yes straight away. So because I had my eyes open, I was able to lower my monthly bill uh, because this is actually a consumer good that the company is interested in pushing. So I just wanted to encourage other people to maybe go through their bills on Black Friday and really think just because this payment seems like a total necessity for me, maybe it could still fall into the category of a consumer good that the company is then willing to negotiate about, or they might just put it on sale soon. All right, y'all, that's it for this episode. If you have a question for The Minimalists, give us a call, 406-219-7839. You can also email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. And if you leave here with just one message today, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. And remember, read more, get informed. The Minimalists.